Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. So we moved here from downtown. Uh, we were members at Houston's First. That was really our community down there. And that was actually the hardest thing to leave downtown when we moved to, the, to Spring, was that community. It left a little hole in our, in our heart a little bit because we didn't have that group that you saw every week that you knew and you kind of sat with in church. When we came to Faith Bridge, we kind of had to had to you know find a group to, to meet with Jump and in. and um, it just takes time to really build relationships. So Josh and Tiffany Ross have been with us for probably two years now. Maybe three. I, don't I think. Know. Yeah. Uh, we have a good time when we're together. We're living life. We all have kids. We all work. We you know we're in the same boat and mm-hmm. we're trying to navigate this together while growing closer to God and having each other as a support and that um, I think is very helpful. And then it shows how much more helpful it is in a time when there is a disaster. So when Hurricane Harvey hit, um, Sunday comes and the water starts getting closer to the house. You don't think that you're ever gonna have a boat come to your house to pick you up at the front door. It happened like that. Like in a matter of 30 minutes or less, we had at least a foot of water in our house. It started seeping in over in the corners. And then when I looked out the window, I see the water is like up to here. It's not down here. And I thought, this is scary. And then I just started smelling the sewage. So like we made the decision to leave. I looked out the window, there's a boat coming around. So we flagged them down. And Josh had called John and said, hey, come get us. You know, I'm trying to like hold it together a little bit when we're like starting to flag down a boat to come get us out of our house, right? I'm walking around trying to grab a couple extra things and the wood floors are floating on the water and I'm trying to stomp on this. It was like being in a movie. It was just crazy. We called our grow group, uh, John Bourne, and said, hey man, we're coming out of the neighborhood, come pick us up. That was the moment when I got off the boat and I saw John that I almost started crying just because that uh, level of comfort and I knew that we were gonna be taken care of. Yeah, it was, it was really emotional like to, to show up and have these people there to care for you. And, and so we grabbed them and I took, uh, took them home and we said, hey, you guys just stay with us until this is all over. The next day after the waters finally receded, uh, the Ross's house was able to get cleaned. So I sent a text to all the guys in, uh, in our group. Our grow group came over on Wednesday and started doing all of the knocking out walls and stuff. And it was amazing because everyone showed up. We had, we had like 20 guys here. And we got out here at 10 o'clock in the morning and by three o'clock in the afternoon, this house was done. And throughout the whole week, we went from our house to someone else's house to someone else's house. Right. And we all just kind of got together and for someone that went through this, it kind of puts perspective in your mind about, you know, you know, like, we can get through this. It's touching to see everybody care so much about each other, and we use our own strengths. Like you said, not just with the one member in our group that we wanted to care for and support, but, you know, my uncle and somebody else's aunt, and it was whoever needed help, mm-hmm. the whole group went. And even Josh and Tiffany, who are trying to deal with their own house, are still going out and helping, you know, with when we needed them. and. That really is a testament to the group on who they are. I was overcome with emotion when you start to think about how much love everybody is just giving you. You know, that, that was the biggest drawback of leaving downtown for us was yeah. leaving our community behind. And so, you know, when you pray for community, you know, God doesn't just send a community to you all right. the time. Sometimes he gives you a situation where you really have to build community. And that's what this was. It was really just a chance to really build our relationships with our grow group. And uh, there's no comparison to what it means to have people right there living next to you that you're doing life with. To see them all step up um, and come over uh, showed us how much they loved us. And I think that's what's really important. When we met people in our own neighborhood, 
you know, just building these relationships, um, there's no comparison to what it means to have people right there living next to you that you're doing life with. Yeah, it's been a, we've been praying for since we moved up here that this was, you know, what we find and, you know, I think we found it now. Well, amen. Can we celebrate that this morning? Yeah. <clears throat> that is the picture perfect example of what it means to walk and live in real community. And that's what we're talking about today as we continue looking at the life of David. So if you will, grab a Bible, start turning with me to 1 Samuel 23. That's where we're going to be. The ushers are coming down in all of our rooms. If you need a Bible this morning, they'd be happy to give you one. You just got to raise your hand. As you're getting your Bibles situated, I will share with you uh, that in just three days, Jill and I are celebrating our second anniversary. Yeah. That's right. We've been married for two years, and I was kind of thinking back this week on some of the special moments that we've shared as a couple, and I thought it'd be worth sharing one of those with you this morning. This one actually is all the way back at the very beginning of our relationship. We had been dating for about a month, and I began to realize that Jill was crazy about me. <laughs> at least that's what I was hoping anyways, because I was crazy about her. And I started to think, you know, at some point, we're going to need to have a first kiss. And so I started thinking about when could I insert this romantic gesture? And the perfect moment arrived. You see, Jill was headed off for a vacation to Italy. She was going to be gone for 10 days. And I realized this is it. She's asked me to take her to the airport. And so I began daydreaming of this moment where we would pull up to the airport we would have our first kiss, the fireworks would go off. She would be left thinking only of me so she wouldn't even notice those Italian men who were chasing her down. And then it would give me 10 whole days to come down from this romantic high that I would be on. So the plan was in place and the day arrived. And I had thought as we come to the airport, I'm gonna give her two things. The first is gonna be a stack of letters one for each and every day of her trip. And the second, well, y'all know what that is already. And so we arrive at the airport, and right as she's reaching for the door, I said, hey, before you go, I want to give you two things. And with that, I handed her the stack of letters, and right there in front of me, I could just see her melting. And I was like, this is perfect. And so then I said, I'd also like to give you a kiss. Is it okay if I kiss you? And to be honest with you, I didn't even wait. I just kind of started leaning across because I knew it was going to be a yes. And it wasn't until I was about halfway there that I realized her head was shaking side to side, <laughs> not up and down. And there was only one way to escape the awkwardness of that moment and that was to get the heck out of there. And so as quick as I could, I grabbed her suitcases, I put them on the curb, I somehow managed to give her a side hug, though I did not make any eye contact, and then I got back in the car and I took off. And as I was leaving the scene, my mind was spinning. Now, I mean, at first I was embarrassed. I thought, I'm such an idiot. How could I have misread this situation? And then I was downcast. I was sad. I thought, we must not be on the same page. Here I thought things were moving forward. And then eventually, I was devastated. I thought, there's no way we can recover from this. This is the end of our relationship. And, and I know that may seem funny in this moment, but I can promise you in that moment, it was not. And I really didn't know what to do. And so in that moment, I, I did the only thing that I knew to do, which was reach out to my friend, Wayne. And within a few moments, Wayne was on the phone, and over the course of our conversation, we had a little bit of laughter, a whole lot of perspective, and he helped me realize, Sully, this isn't that big of a deal. In fact, this is a good thing, because if this keeps going, and if one day you get married, and if one day you have a family, and if that family includes a little girl, you're going to want this story when she's a teenager. 
You know, I was so thankful to have a friend like Wayne in that moment who could speak into my life and give me that perspective. And I'll tell you, if not for Wayne, the tone of that conversation Jill and I shared later that day would have been very different. But as it was, we were able to move on. And as I shared just a moment ago, we're going to be married for two years this week. You know, my guess this morning is that every one of us has a moment like that. A moment where the news is devastating and you really don't know what to do. I mean, maybe it's the moment where the phone rings and you learn you didn't get the job. Or the moment when your boss invites you into his office and you think you're there for a promotion and you come to find out you're being let go. Or maybe it's the moment where your kid comes to you and you realize that they are struggling in school or that they didn't make the band or that they were cut from the sports team. Or it could be the moment where the doctor slides some test results across the table to you and when you look at them, you realize this isn't good. Moments where you enter into a difficult situation and you simply don't know what to do. It's in moments like this when we all need a wing. We need somebody who can enter into the scene and walk us through this difficult situation in our lives. And this morning, we are going to find David in one of these moments. David is going to be in a cave. His back is going to be against the wall, and he doesn't know what to do. And it's in this moment that we're going to see a friend come to David's side, and it's going to make all of the difference. Before we look at this story, I want you to do something. I want you to take the notes that you were given this morning, and I want you to take just a minute and write down the names of your closest friends. Who are the people in your life that you would say, these are my closest friends? Maybe it's the list of names that you find under your favorite section in your iPhone. The people that you would go on vacation with. Who are the people in your life that you are closest to? And as you're writing down those names and thinking about those names, I also want you to think about whose list am I on? Who would say, yes, you are my closest friend. You're the person that I count on. Who are those people? And this morning, we are going to look at a friendship between David and his friend Jonathan. And this was a unique friendship. It was a friendship that was purposeful, meaningful, and life-giving. And so as we look at this friendship, what I want you to do is compare their friendship to your friendships the friendships that you maintain? How do they stack up as we look at this genuine, real friendship? Not a friendship built on social status or reputation. This is a real friendship. Let's look at it together in 1 Samuel 23, starting in verse 14. It says, David stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills of the desert Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him. But God did not give David into his hands. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. This is a devastating moment in David's life. David has just learned that Saul and his troops are on a mission, and it's a one point agenda to kill David. And this is a low moment. And you see, this is not the first time that this happened in David's life. This is the eighth time that Saul has plotted and attempted to kill David. Seven times before this has happened. This is a low moment. Let's keep reading. It says, And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh, and he helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. In David's moment of weakness, his friend Jonathan comes to his side, and he shows us what it means to be a true friend. 
This morning, we're going to look at three things that Jonathan does for David that are the true markers of friendship. The first thing we see Jonathan do for David is he moves towards David. Jonathan didn't wait for David to call. He didn't wait for David to ask for help. In verse 16, we read that it says, Jonathan went to David at Haresh. And I know this may seem like a small thing, but I can promise you that it isn't. This is what true friends do. When they realize that you're in a moment of need, they move towards you. Real friends enter into your corner when you're cornered. A real friend walks in when everyone else walks out. And a real friend sees you through when everyone else says you are through. I was remembering back to a few years ago when I went to a concert at the House of Blues. And I had arrived early and was waiting in line to get in. And I noticed as I was standing in line, a group of students coming up to where the line was. And about the time that they reached where I was standing, a girl in their group collapsed, and she began to throw up everywhere. And I couldn't believe what happened next. All of her friends scattered. They left this poor girl all alone to fend for herself. And it wasn't until a stranger came up and helped her get medical attention that she was okay. And my fear is that that's when we find out that we don't have real friends. It's in a moment of crisis, it's in a moment of hardship when you realize if you have true friends. And the way you realize it is based on their movement. Are they moving towards you or are they moving away from you? I wonder this morning, do you have friends like Jonathan? Friends that when a difficult situation arises, they don't wait for you to call. They step into the moment with you. And I wonder this morning, what type of friend are you? What would your closest friends say about you? Would they say, you know what, more than anybody else, I know I can count on that guy to be there. Come whatever, he's going to be by my side. That's the first thing we learn from Jonathan. It's the first marker of true friendship. That when a moment of crisis comes, true friends move towards you. The second thing we see from Jonathan is that the scripture tells us that he helped David find strength in God. In this moment, all David can see is Saul's troops lining up. All David can focus on is the fact that somebody is coming to take his life. He's lost all sight of God. And in this moment, Jonathan enters in and he helps him get his mind back on God and away from the chaos. And he does this by pointing David to God's promises. Look at verse 17 again. It says, don't be afraid. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. Jonathan enters into this moment with David, and he helps point him back to God's promises. He says, David, God has not forgotten you. The promise that God made to you when he anointed you king over Israel is not lost on him. He's still seeing you as king. It's in this moment that Jonathan steps in and he helps David get his eyes off of the problem and onto the promises of God. I've shared this story with you before, but I was thinking back to my final year at Texas A&M. I was studying for the CPA exam and finishing up my master's in accounting. And the CPA exam is a very difficult exam. It's made up of four parts. You must make a 75 on each of the four parts. And in order to prepare for each of those parts, I would study for an entire month, seven to 10 hours a day studying. It was torture. And the day arrived, I took the exam, and a few weeks later, I get my score back. I'd made a 74, one point short of passing. 
You know, I never cried over a single exam grade at Texas A&M, but I'll tell you, when I got that grade, I absolutely wept. I was devastated. And you know, the more I focused on that 74, the more I thought, I've let my, I've let my parents down. The more I focused on that 74, I thought, there's no way I'm ever going to be a CPA. I can't pass any of these. And the more I focused on that 74, I started to believe that I was a complete failure. And it was in the midst of my devastation that I remember a friend called me. And he said, I want to remind you of two of God's promises. The first is in Jeremiah 29, 11, where it says, I know the plans I have for you. He reminded me, God has a plan for your life. And the second promise he pointed me to was Romans 8, 28. He says, God works everything for good. He said, even the things you wish for different, were different, God is using those things right now. He's using them to shape you. He's using them to build your trust in him. And God is making sure that your identity is not found in being a CPA, it's not found in being able to pass an exam. It's found in Christ. So thankful for my friend who could point me to the promises of God. And I wonder, who are your friends? Are they people who can help you get rid of the problem and put your mind onto the promises of God? Are they able to step into a difficult situation and help you see this is temporary? We've got a hope that is eternal. And what about you? What kind of friend are you? Are you the type of friend who helps your friends draw closer to God in a moment of difficulty? Or would they say, no, he just helps me draw closer to a Texans game or the most popular show on Netflix? What type of friend are you? This is the second thing we see from David, it's that, or Jonathan, it's that he helps David find strength in God by pointing to God's promises. The third and final thing we see Jonathan do for David is he sacrifices his life for David. The scripture is quick to highlight in verse 16 that Jonathan is Saul's son. Why does it do that for us? Is it because it's doing that Bible thing where it introduces you based on who your father was? No. This isn't the first time we've met Jonathan. In fact, if you read a few chapters before, we learn that Saul, uh, Jonathan is actually Saul's eldest son. Furthermore, we learn that he was a leader and a great warrior. So why is it in this moment that we're reminded that he is Saul's son? I think it's because the scripture wants us to see just how big of a sacrifice Jonathan was making for David. You see, as Saul's eldest son, he was next in line to be king. And Jonathan had all the makings of a king. I mentioned just a second ago that he was a great leader. He was a mighty warrior. But when Jonathan met David, he realized God has put a call on this guy's life to be king. And I'm not going to stand in the way. I'm not going to squash that. Instead, I'm going to help my friend achieve the call that God has put on his life. Jonathan steps aside. He lays down his position. And he sacrifices every part of himself to help David reach his true calling. What's amazing is that more than wanting to be king, Jonathan wanted to be a friend. Do you have friends in your life who are like that? That more than receiving a promotion at work, more than achieving a certain social status, they want to be your friend. They want to be there to encourage you and help you become the person that God has called you to be. And what would your friends say about you? Are you the type of person that can speak life, that can speak encouragement to your friends? Are you the type of person who sacrifices yourself to help your friends move forward? This is the third and final thing we see from Jonathan. He sacrificed his life 
for David. And you know, as I looked at this example of friendship that the scripture gives, I started to realize that Jonathan isn't the only friend we see in scripture. There's another friend named Jesus, the friend of sinners. Jesus, who saw us in a moment of weakness, and he moved towards us. It says in Romans 5, 8, it says that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That Christ looked down on us in our brokenness and said, I'm going to move towards it. I'm going to fix that. And this same Jesus who helps point us to God, he helps point us to God and focus on his promises, but not only that, he fulfills God's promises. He's the Savior that we need. And this Jesus, who came to earth to sacrifice his life, that we might have life. In Philippians 2, it says that Jesus existed in the form of God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. Being a found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And it's through that death that Romans 8 tells us that we are heirs of God, that we are children of God, that Jesus said, I'm going to sacrifice my position as king so that you can be called a child of God. Jesus is the ultimate representation of friendship. And Jesus came to be our friend. But he didn't come just to be our friend. He came to give us an example of what it means to be friends to one another. He told us in John 13, he says to his disciples, I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. He said, this is what it looks like to be a friend. Now go and do it for each other. And friends, I can tell you that practicing this type of friendship, it doesn't happen by accident. It takes intentionality. And it's for this reason that so often we highlight grow groups. We put such an emphasis on small groups, on getting in a small group, getting in community, because it's in grow groups where we get the opportunity to receive true friendship, like we saw in the video this morning. And it's in grow groups that we get the opportunity to practice true friendship. And so if you're here this morning and you say, man, I don't have friends. I mean, sure, I've got names on the top of my paper. They're names that I could go watch a sports game with or go out to eat with. Or maybe they're someone on my kid's sports team. But I don't have True friends, friends like Jonathan. Well, I want to invite you, if that is you, to head out to our open house today. As you walked in this morning at the Woodlands campus, at the Klein campus, you notice there's tables out there. They're intended for you to sign up, to join in with a grow group, to get in community. Don't leave here today without taking that step. Some of you are here and you've taken that step and you say, well, Sully, what do you've got for me? My challenge to you is to be Jonathan, to enter into your grow group each and every week, to enter into your community with purpose, with meaning, looking for ways to love and care for your friends in the same way that Jonathan loved and cared for David to enter in and look around and say, where is it that I can sacrifice? Where is it that I can move towards my friends? My hope and my prayer this morning has been that we would not leave here today without seeking true friendship, without looking for ways that we can practice true friendship in our lives. Let's pray. Well, God, we come before you right now and we just thank you 
for the example of Jonathan, and more importantly, for the example of Jesus. Your son, Jesus, who looked down from heaven, who saw us in our brokenness and said, I'm going to move towards that. I'm going to fulfill the promises of God to send a rescuer. I'm going to be that person. And I'm going to sacrifice my life so that they can have life. God, I pray this morning for us to receive that gift of friendship. God, for those who are in the room and say, I I don't have a friendship with Jesus. God, would you meet with them this morning? Would you speak to them even now? Your friendship is an open invitation. God, for those of us who are in the room that are in community, God, who are in grow groups, God, I pray that this week, They would look at their grow group as an opportunity to be a friend like Jonathan. That they would look for opportunities to serve, to help others refill. Got to move towards and engage in community. God, and finally, I pray for those who are in this room who don't have community. There are people who, they've been here for a while, they've been thinking about taking that step, but then they look at the time it takes or that they're just too busy. And and God, I pray that you would squash all of those things. God, community is important. We were built for relationship. And so Lord, I pray that you would give them courage today. God, it takes courage to walk out of here and approach a table and get information. I know that is true. So God, would you give courage today? Lord, I pray that you would also give courage for this week as they get information about where the grow groups are meeting and who the leaders are, is that they would take another step, which is to go to the group, God, and that you would meet them there, that they would see this is what community looks like, that it would be life-changing. God, we want to be your people. We want to live in community like that. So Lord, help us. Give us the strength we need. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Dan Slagle, and today I am with Michael Sully Sullivan, who brought us a terrific message on friendship, taking an inventory of the friendship that existed between King David and Jonathan. Welcome, Sully. Thanks for having me. It was a great message. Uh, I really appreciated the different aspects of friendship that were brought to bear. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about uh, some aspects of friendship in general Mm -hmm. that are reflected in Jonathan and David that perhaps uh, time just did not allow for you to get to. And, and, And one of those is Um, what we were talking about earlier, the seasonal component of friendship, Mm -hmm. how uh, as we move through life, um, we don't necessarily keep the same sets Mm -hmm. of friends, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, You know, some people are very fortunate, and maybe they grow up in a small town, and their best friend from kindergarten is there, and they never leave the town, and they're there their whole lives, and, and they get to share that relationship. But for most of us, my experience, your experience has been you move around. Mm-hmm. You know, you grow up in one town, you go to college somewhere else, you get your first job somewhere, you know, you, you move throughout life. And what I thought was so interesting about David and Jonathan's relationship is that this is the case for them. They were friends before David became king. And actually, right before David officially takes the position, Jonathan dies in battle. Right. And so they really were friends in this scholars would say probably 15 year period between Goliath and him actually taking the kingship. And it was really a difficult season of David's life. Mm -hmm. Most of from chapter 17 of 1 Samuel when David slays Goliath to him actually becoming king is running from Saul, fearful for his life. Um, And Jonathan was there for him in that season. And he was not by his side when he was king, but God provided a man that we talked about a little bit last week, 
named Nathan. Mm -hmm. And so in different seasons of David's life, he provided a friend. And I think from my experience, the temptation is to live kind of uh, reminiscing yeah. of those old friendships. You know, when you, you have, especially from my friends at college, man, we were so close because we were all taking, had the same schedules. We were all taking the same classes. We were all working together. I mean, we were doing, we lived together. We were doing life together. And then you get into the business world and you can't spend every single hour of every day sure. with them and, and relationships change and new relationships form. So I think the temptation is to try and just keep those friendships only when you need people in your current context. You know, I think about what I was talking about today, who's going to move towards you in a moment of crisis. Here recently we've had floods and you need some friends around you here in Indeed. Houston that can come like the testimony story we saw come to your rescue and get you out of the boat. If your only friend is in Dallas, you'll be waiting on the Tough. side of the road for a long time. So I, I just think that that is a, it's a component of friendship that a lot of people struggle to, to move along, but God provides in different seasons of our life the friend that we need in that moment. Yes, he does. One thing I've always appreciated about my parents, uh, they're 91 now, hmm. living in their hometown. The reality is their friends have all gone to heaven. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but they have been very purposeful all throughout their life of making new sets of friends. Mm. And now they have an entirely different community of people much younger than they are mm. that is a great blessing to them. Sure. Whereas if they didn't have those, life could be pretty tough. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Friendships change, uh, but the opportunity to make new friends is always there. Sure. Another thing we talked about was the noticeable difference in background mm -hmm. between David and Jonathan. Whereas Jonathan grew up in a palace mm -hmm. and was accustomed to all the benefits and privileges of that, uh, David grew up in the fields tending sheep and then even as a young man <laughs> had to live in caves yeah. uh, running for his life. Talk sure. some about, about the uh, value of different backgrounds and friendships. Sure. Yeah, it really is remarkable to think about uh, just how different their upbringings were. But I think about how valuable it must have been for David to have a friend like Jonathan who could speak to, hey, this is what it's like in the palace. Here's the type of decisions you're one day going to have to make sure. as king. Uh, not only that, I think about what a value it must have been to David as a father to sit there and learn from the son of a king of these are the things maybe I wish my dad would have done differently. I just think there's a lot of value when you have a diverse background of friends. If all of your friends are like you, then your worldview is strictly related to what you've experienced. Yeah. But, um, you know, kind of what you were talking about with your parents, having friends of different ages gives a different lens uh, because you grow up in different generations. Mm -hmm. I was talking to Jill and just remarking how many of our friends are at different stages of life that have kids and are parenting. But I love that because we're getting a lens of what hopefully our future will be. And, and just there's an opportunity to share and to expand your worldview that I think is very helpful. So if you look around and say, oh, all of my friends look exactly like me, it might be time to, to expand that out a little bit. So. I, I agree. My uh, travels overseas hmm. have really highlighted this truth for me. Sure. I've made some wonderful friends from some cultures that I never dreamed mm -hmm. I, I would be a part of or, sure. or get to know. And they have added so much to my life. Yeah. I'm very appreciative for those different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of Jill, yeah. uh, I'm sure there are any number of viewers who would love to hear the rest of the story. I mean, of course you got married, but uh, yeah. in that particular instance, yeah. how, how do we, uh, how did you wrap that one up? Sure, well, uh, hats off to Wayne. Uh, Wayne Risher, our Woodlands campus pastor, who talked me off the ledge. Um, in fact, it was funny when I texted him, his first response was to send me a picture of a couple who was kissing with a big red X through it and got me laughing pretty quickly. I was devastated. I'm like, I can't believe he sent me that. But it was a funny moment that, if you know Wayne, that was really just what I needed in the moment. But, you know, he talked me off the ledge, and, and Jill flew from Houston to Atlanta. So I remember when she got to Atlanta, she called me, and luckily I'd already talked to Wayne because I don't know what I would have said oh the boy. first time. Yeah. But you know, it was a sweet conversation, and in it what I learned is that, and I did not know this about Jill up until this moment, was that she had never been kissed before. Oh. And so that's why there was this moment of hesitation. Sure. She said, I wish I, I would have, but 
I'd never done that. And so it, she just hesitated in the moment. And, you know, what was really neat about that for me is I was like, this is a catch right here. You know, she has valued purity, you know, into her 20s, which is not the case for a lot of people. That's right. And if I could say anything to especially high school girls or middle school girls who are going through relationships, that was a, a very attractive thing to me. And um, that was the kind of girl that I wanted. And I think that, you know, being pure and maintaining that is of the utmost importance. And there will be guys out there who that is what's attractive. And that's the relationships that I think last. And so um, that was interesting. A lot of people have asked out in the atrium, you know, well, when did you have your first kiss? I told somebody, I said, I think my pride was able to be cleaned up in about a month. And I think we finally got to it about a month <laughs> later, but I was pretty scared <laughs> every time thinking about that moment going forward. And uh, we eventually got there and now we're married. So it's all good now. It is all good. And uh, we're, we're so glad that both of you are a part of our community here yeah. and that you provide the friendship for us yeah. that you do. Good, good sermon. Good message for all of us. Thanks. thanks. Yeah. yeah. And thanks for being with us. Hope you'll join us next time for Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.